Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome here to Emmanuel. It's so good to see everybody here for worship this day. And we also say howdy to those who are watching online. We uh, do enjoy having you with us, and we hope to see you in person very, very soon. Uh, just a few announcements to make. First off, I would remind everybody of the blood drive that is coming up this Wednesday. Um, it'll happen here at the church from, uh, from noon to 6 o'clock. Um, you can call the church office for appointment, and even better yet, you can go online to the American Red Cross blood donation site, type in Emmanuel Lutheran, uh, and it'll lead, lead you to us, and we'll go ahead and have you sign up that way as well. Um, we need blood, or we don't need blood, but the Red Cross needs blood to give to people who really do, and so would encourage everybody to be a part of that if you can. The other thing we thought we would talk about just a little bit is uh, the schedule coming up in the weeks to come. And first of all, next week we are planning on recording the seventh Sunday in Easter, just like we usually do. That'll happen exactly a week from now, six o'clock on Thursday evening. However, next Thursday is also Ascension Day. And uh, we're going to, as soon as we're done recording this service at six, we're going to record and, and actually stream live the Ascension Day service. It's going to happen at seven. It's going to be a little out of order, but we've been doing a lot of things out of order during this time of pandemic. So we're, we're kind of old pros at it right now, but, uh, anything but, by the way, but, uh, but that's kind of what we're doing. We're hoping, and this is a tentative schedule unless things change drastically, we are planning on moving worship to Sunday morning on May 31st, which is awesome because that's the day of Pentecost. And... Uh, so we'll be looking at doing that. Uh, we believe we're going to go ahead and leave the service at 10.30 on May 31st. That way we're going to move the Bible study that's, in the, uh, um, that's on Zoom. We're going to move that to 9 o'clock. And that will give everybody a chance to attend Bible study. And if they so choose, they can come on into church. There will be plenty of time for them to get here. And I do believe that's all the announcements I have, Pastor. That sounds great, Pastor Sparling. I know I'm anxious to get back onto a normal routine on Sundays again. Uh, speaking, yeah, yeah, speaking of normal routines, our high schoolers, I invite you to join us Wednesday nights, our last session, and we, we've been doing a session on surrender, and our last session will be this Wednesday, 7 o'clock on Zoom. So we invite all high schoolers, come and join us as uh, we talk about surrendering. And that's all I've got, Pastor. Oh, I was practicing. No, just kidding. But anyway, that's all we got. We're going to go ahead and begin with the first hymn for today, and that is Built on the Rock. God bless us as we gather together.
please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, We poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O O most merciful God, God, who who has has given given your only begotten begotten Son to die for for us, us. have Have mercy mercy upon us, And for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given His only Son to die for us, and for His sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on His name, He gives power to become the children of God, and has promised them His Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment they stand this day. For all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Your word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path.
Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading for the sixth Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 17. While Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What, therefore, you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ has risen from the dead. God God the the Father Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. The epistle is from the third chapter of 1 Peter. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. 
For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into the heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Please stand. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please proceed. Dear Christian, 
unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, there's a meme that's been going around recently that has caught my attention, and it's been going around for a while, and at first, I have to admit, I rolled my eyes a little bit when I saw this one, but the longer it's been going around, the more truth there is to it. Maybe you've seen it too. It's that picture of Bill Murray from Groundhog Day, right? And if you've seen the movie, he lives that day over and over again. And of course, underneath that picture, it says it's quarantine day again. Maybe you feel like that. I know that I do, right? It feels like we just can't break out of this same routine. That we've kind of fallen into the same old, same old, if you will. And you know, that's not good for us because we're a people, a culture that loves the new, right? We're constantly looking to that next new thing or that next thing on the horizon, you know, that next tech app that we can get our hands on, the next new iPhone. Well, that's not easy when all the Apple stores are closed off to us, is it? That next new blockbuster movie that we've been looking forward to, you know, summer's a great time for that, full of those action flicks that we love. That's not easy either when all the movie theaters are closed. Maybe that next adventure, that next trip that we had planned, that next thing that we were going to go see for the first time, well, that's not easy when all of our vacation plans seem to be canceled. You know, it's tough when it feels like sometimes we're stuck in that rut, when we're stuck in that same old, same old, and we're left longing for something new. You know, if there's someone that knew about a new life lived in Jesus Christ, it's Paul, isn't it? In fact, the book of Acts contains that familiar story of Saul of Tarsus wandering on that road to Damascus when all of a sudden Jesus Christ appears to him, that tyrant and persecutor of the church, no longer. He would become Paul, rather missionary, proclaimer of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen missionary to the people of God. And that missionary Paul, we see him in Acts chapter 17 today. And I love this reading. And it starts out by saying, while Paul was waiting for them, you see, what had happened right before this reading we got to hear today was that they were all in Berea. Paul and Silas, his traveling companion, and the young man Timothy. And if you remember in Berea, things went really well. As Paul proclaimed, Jesus Christ crucified and risen for you, the hearts of the people attached onto that word. They felt that spirit drawing them to learn more. That is, until the agitators came into Berea. And they tried to chase the people away from Paul and that message. So those three missionaries got together and they decided the best plan of attack was to send Paul on ahead. To get him on a boat, to send him ahead to Athens. And Silas and Timothy, they would stay behind and they would continue the work in Berea. So Paul gets on the boat and he heads to Athens. And that's where our reading picked up today in Acts chapter 17. We see as Paul lands in Athens, and it says that when he got to Athens, the spirit of Paul was provoked. Well, to really understand what that means, we have to know a little bit about Athens. This was actually a big center for polytheistic worship. They had all kinds of Greek gods and goddesses. They worshiped well, just about anyone and everything. In fact, all of Athens was filled with statues and altars to the various gods and goddesses. That great big pantheon was built in honor of Athena as a temple to her. So is it any wonder that Paul's spirit was provoked when he got into Athens, when he saw all of these things going on, this polytheistic worship? And you know, we might, when we know Paul, think that he's going to come in just like his letter to the Galatians, coming in with those combat boots on and ready to lay down the law and really stick it to these people that have been worshiping the wrong gods. But rather, the spirit inside Paul gives him wisdom, patience, and discernment instead. So Paul gets to work. And he does what he normally does on a missionary journey, even though he's all by himself this time. 
He goes first to the synagogue and he meets with the Jewish men and he starts to reason with them about what they know in the Old Testament to be true and introduce to them Jesus Christ. Paul goes out into those busy, bustling marketplaces and he meets with anyone and everyone who goes by doing all the normal things of life. You know, those marketplaces, they'd actually be the spots where the famous thinkers, the philosophers would be. In fact, Athens was home to some big names. Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and Paul. Paul would preach Christ crucified to anyone who would walk by and who would listen. And there was a mixed reaction, wasn't there? We get some of that reaction in here. Some of the people went by and they said, what does this babbler have to say, right? Sounds like he's talking about foreign divinities as he talks about this Jesus. But others were stirred up in the Spirit and they wanted to know more. So they grab Paul and they say, would you tell us more about Jesus? And they lead him to the Areopagus. Kind of his third opportunity to get this message out, right? With the synagogue, the marketplace, and finally, the Areopagus. It was a a rocky outcropping where uh, city council meetings would be held, the occasional trial, and of course, religious debates So they bring Paul up front and they want to hear about Jesus. And that's when Luke includes verse 21, my favorite part of this reading. Luke writes this, he says, Now all of the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Right? It was new or bust for them. If it was something old that they'd heard about, they didn't want to hear about it. They wanted to hear about something new. It's a good chance they had at least kind of a base understanding of the Old Testament. At least there were synagogues all over Athens, so they might have known about this Old Testament gods that the Jews would talk about. But what they didn't know was Jesus. And that idea of something new was intriguing to them. And so Paul had the perfect opportunity and the perfect stage to proclaim Christ to the people. But where to begin? Where was Paul going to start talking to this polytheistic, idolatrous people? And you know, as Paul stood there, as he looked around in that picture of Athens, could he see the pantheon kind of looming in the distance, that temple to Athena? Could he think about all of those statues he'd seen? All of the altars that were erected to the various gods. In fact, one particular one comes to his mind, doesn't it? An altar that has been dedicated to an unknown God. You see, the problem with a polytheistic religion is you're bound to forget some of the gods that are out there, right? When you have a a whole buffet line of gods, you're, you're going to miss some of them. So what they had done is they'd erected this altar to an unknown God. To a God that, oops, they'd forgotten. They didn't know about That's what this altar was for. And Paul directs them to this idea of this altar of the unknown God. And he says, what you worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. This would have been tough for the Athenian people. First of all, Paul tells them there's only one God, right? The creator and sustainer of all life. That buffet line of gods that you've been building temples to and worshiping, they're not God. Paul knew what it was. They were worshiping Satan himself in their idolatrous worship. Rather, he points them to the creating and sustaining God, the true God. Secondly, he tells them that this God isn't interested in temples. He's not interested in statues. He's not interested in altars being erected to him. He's interested in the hearts. Paul directs them to a repentant heart rather than anything that can be built with human hands. And Paul tells them that that repentant heart is important because the man that God has appointed is coming back on judgment day. Right, there's a timeline on this repentant heart. 
And that becomes a bit of a problem because human characteristic, our defining characteristic, hasn't been that we are repentant. In fact, more often than not, when we read the Old Testament, when we think about the history of God's people, we see them fail to have a repentant heart. You know, repentance isn't just about good intentions. It's not just about wishful thinking for my life. It's about real change. It's about real visible change. That repentant heart should be visible to all of us that are around that person. And you know, Jesus in John chapter 14 starts to talk about what this repentant heart looks like. As those disciples are gathered around him, what does he say? But if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What does a repentant heart look like but a heart that is set to do God's word and his will, that is set toward him to do all of those things that he asks of us? It's a heart that has changed. Well, you know, for us, that's not always easy, is it? In fact, we could throw about any Lutheran joke in right about here, right about how we don't like change. But isn't it funny that in a culture that loves the next new thing, that next thing on the horizon, we are so content to live in our old sin. We are so content to live in those old habits that we've built up for ourselves. And we're so resistant to the new change that Jesus Christ gives to us in his forgiveness. You know, Jesus knew that his disciples sitting there with him, those people gathered in Athens, and yes, even us today, we would be incapable of keeping those commandments perfectly. And that's why Jesus wasn't done yet. He said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, even the Spirit of truth. Jesus gives us a helper because he knew we couldn't do the work on our own. He gives us the Spirit. That Spirit who makes all things new. When we think about that Spirit that was placed upon us in our baptism, do we think about that water and how refreshing it is, how reinvigorating it is when we think about our baptism and what's been done to us through the grace of our God? When we talk about that one that was appointed from God, that came down to earth for us, we hear what Paul said to the people of Athens. We have a God that is near to us. He's not far off. He's not like those Greek gods that they had to hope would come down to these temples they build. No, our God is near. We have a God that promises that he is near to the brokenhearted. So near that he sent his son to come and walk on this earth, to get his feet dirty, to stick his feet in the mud for us. That's how near our God is. He sent his son to die and to rise for you and for me. And you know, that reaction in Athens was also mixed. There were some that mocked Paul and the words he had to say, but there were others who were led by the Spirit to ask for more. They wanted to continue to hear about this new thing, to continue to hear about Jesus Christ crucified and risen for them. And you know, for us today, when we talk about being stuck in a rut, our God is not content for us to live in the same old, same old, not even during a time of pandemic. No, our God calls us to live in that newness of life that he's given to us through his Spirit and his Son. He calls us in that Spirit to realize every morning as we wake up and remember our baptism, that reinvigorating power in us. He calls us to remember to ask ourselves that question, what can I do for my neighbor today? How can I show the love that's been shown to me to them? That's what a new life looks like. A life filled with the opportunity just like Paul had in Acts chapter 17 in Athens. Maybe it's that opportunity to go out and to share what God has done for you, how your heart has been made new in Jesus Christ our Lord. Our God makes things new. In fact, as John sits before the throne in Revelation chapter 21, do you remember what God says? Behold, I am making all things new. Lamentations 3.23 tells us the mercies of God are new every morning. We have a God that is not content with leaving us in that same old, same old. 
God calls us to live in the newness of life, with a new heart filled with forgiveness, filled with His grace. That's what our God does. He reaches down even into the midst of those times when we feel stuck in a rut, and He gives us something new. His Spirit at work in us. It's in the name of Jesus we say, Amen. Together we join our voices as we sing the offertory. Pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the faithful proclamation of Jesus Christ to those who do not know him, that through the hearing, that through hearing the word of the Lord many may be brought to faith and to the knowledge of the truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the church of God here and everywhere, that all who confess Jesus Christ may be united in doctrine and witness, defended against all the assaults of the enemy, and eager to gather together around your word and sacrament in love for one another, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this parish, for the work of the kingdom in our community, and for the resources to accomplish all that God desires, that His name may be glorified among us and His purpose fulfilled in our words and works. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the agencies and institutions through which we love our neighbor and provide for those in need, for the destitute and homeless, and for everyone who suffers unemployment and underemployment, that we may aid them in their needs and assist them to find honorable labor to supply all their needs. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the lonely who suffer the burdens of life without friendship or family, for those depressed or weary of pandemic measures, and for the fellowship of the church that we may bear one another's burdens and live in community with Christ as our head. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and those who recover, including Arlene Blesson as she recovers from knee surgery, and for Susie Shalon as she continues in her recovery, for Dan Saney, Nancy Schultz, and Sarah Luxinger's friend Terry Reed, who are receiving treatment for cancer, for Cindy Jansen's continued recovery, and for Josh Prater, who has been diagnosed with COVID-19. For Sherdell Mueller and Paul Insinger, who remain in constant need of care. And for all whom we name in our hearts, that God would grant healing to their bodies and peace for their minds. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the family and friends of Lucille Hines, who was called to her eternal rest this last weekend, and for all who mourn, that they might be comforted with the promise of the glorious resurrection and a happy reunion in heaven for those who trust in Jesus for salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Landon Allen Laid, as he is brought into God's family through the water and word of holy baptism, that he may faithfully keep the covenant into which he has been called, boldly confess his Savior, and finally share with all your saints the joys of eternal life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. 
for the nation, for those who lead our nation, for the end of the pandemic, for peace among nations, and for an end to terror and violence, that we may work for the common good so that justice may prevail, life be protected, and truth abound. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We remain standing for the closing hymn. Pray that God would richly bless you. And uh, Pastor, you have anything else to add? Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> Great. Go in peace and serve the Lord, everybody. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm. Wave at each other, too. <laughs> <laughs>